Hey everyone and welcome back to another industry news roundup and uh, damn, it's quite the show today. So, Microsoft, they have just attacked Apple for the second time this month and this is all while the Epic vs. Apple cases judge has uh, actually made their first ruling, which is fairly spicy. Past that though, we've got Halo rumors, the sad, actually very sad Skullgirl situation and a new Switch. Now, do you want to help us out and also get some cool loot in the process? Well, it is Monk Month over on our Patreon, you will get the Monk class pin along with this charming as hell bookmark. He actually peeks out at you in books, which is kind of nice. And uh, then, of course, art for your walls. You get all that loot delivered to your mailbox. Of course, we also do the daily briefing over there every single weekday, as well as a weekly feature too. So, patrons, thanks for all your help. That is the loot for August. And with that said, let's get into the video. Microsoft have officially cast their lot with Epic Games in the ongoing legal battle, and it's kind of it's kind of interesting, really, when you take it in full context. So, Phil Spencer has specifically commented, Phil Spencer, of course, is the Xbox boss, but he specifically commented on what I would say is Apple's scorched earth tactic of uh, planning to revoke Epic Games' access to the Apple SDK at the end of this month. Now, Basically, what that would mean is that Epic would, from that point onwards, no longer be able to do Mac and iOS-based things for Unreal Engine. Now, this would really suck for Epic Games themselves, of course, for their own development, but uh, Unreal Engine is, I hear, pretty damn big, and many, many developers who publish Unreal games on, say, iOS would be in quite a pickle in that situation. And this is where Microsoft's filing comes in. So in that, they basically argue that, as an example, they've got an enterprise license for the Unreal Engine. They do talk about how, you know, some companies make their own engines, but it's basically hard to compete with an engine like Unreal. I mean, it's basically Unreal or Unity in terms of the big. There are other ones as well, like Godot and stuff, but they're like your big engines. Uh, so they basically say, yeah, just about everyone has got to use an engine like this, and that if Apple actually went forward with their plan, that it would lead to bad outcomes for Microsoft and other developers. As an example, they call out that they actually have a Forza game on mobile that is made in the Unreal Engine. Now, that would be a big problem if Unreal stops getting updated, and then say you move on to a new version of iOS, and... Uh, Oh dear, now we have a big problem. Now, Microsoft does note that even it is like, it's just even the uncertainty of Unreal Engine's long term iOS, macOS uh, viability, that that is something that's even damaging for creators. And because of that, well, Microsoft says that this could hurt gamers, it could hurt creators, and especially creators who are in the late stages of Unreal uh, Engine development for iOS. I mean, think about that. You're late stage in development, and suddenly your engine, it seems like it's not going to have support. What does that mean for how you've made your game two years into the future? As you can see, that's, uh, that's quite an issue. We're going to loop back to this when we talk about the judge's ruling, but it's important to call out that yes, in this situation, yeah, like Microsoft have pretty stridently cast their lot with Epic in this particular thing, because of course this is the one issue, or the what re I'd say the, the main issue where the fallout between Epic and Apple would actually boil over and impact far, far, far more developers. Now, of course, you could argue that Epic could actually use this to say that, yes, look how much damage to the industry in general this anti-competitive titan Apple is willing to do by taking away our license and hurting all of our sort of clients and partners. I think that's one line that Epic could probably bring up, and potentially that's something the judge might be sympathetic to, as we're going to see. First, though, we do have to take a quick little trip into the past. Do Microsoft have beef with Apple? I think that's something that many people have been talking about, what, since the 80s? But uh, no, we're not talking about history, really. We're talking about this August. Because in this August, Microsoft and Apple uh, got into a bit of a spat. Now, recently, the two companies had been working decently well together, I'd say, under leadership of Microsoft changing with Satya and then focusing more on services, which has meant that things like Microsoft Office have been on Mac OS and iOS, and it all seemed happy, happy until the situation that's cropped up where Apple denied xCloud on iOS. Why? Well, Apple basically argued that they would have to review every single game offered on xCloud and that just, you know, it would be impossible to maintain their safety standards and all that stuff for their customers and that, you know, I, I, like that this stuff could be done through web or other things, but if it's going through the app store, it's got to like meet all of their criteria, whatever. Now, in fairness, this is something from Apple that is consistent with how they have treated other game streaming services in the past, like Google Stadia. 
but it is uniquely draconian. Uh, say, Google don't do this in Android or anything like that, and uh, it is a bit weird. I mean, also, is it hypocritical? Do Apple review every Audible audiobook, Kindle book, Netflix show, Amazon Prime show, etc.? Crunchyroll anime, comic book? I, I don't think they do, right? So, it seems like this is a specific thing that they're applying only really in the gaming sphere, which, uh, I mean, if you think about why, it is a little bit like, hmm, is that just because you want specific, deep control over the gaming sector, which makes you a lot of money? I, I have to wonder, uh, yes, maybe? But anyway, earlier this month, Microsoft specifically cut into Apple in a statement saying this, Apple stands alone as the only general purpose platform to deny customers from cloud gaming and game subscription services like Xbox Game Pass. And in their statement, they highlight that, you know, Apple's thing doesn't even make that much sense because all the games are already rated by the ESRB, which of course cuts out much of Apple's like safety reasoning. Uh, yeah, so what the hell's going on? I mean, it seems obvious. But anyway, their statement basically just ends with this big call for consumer freedoms, which it's the sort of thing where, yeah, it's a great rallying call, and actually ending their statement with that is a real slap to Apple. But of course, we do have to remember that, you know, consumer freedoms, that's the one thing that uh, they're really able to champion over at Xbox. And I think that's because it's the only game they can win next gen. They're probably going to lose in exclusives but they can win on value and things like that. So you can see how, you know, yes, they really do want this, but if you're going to have a world where PS Now and uh, xCloud are both on iOS, I think that would be better for Microsoft than it would be for Sony. So you can see why Microsoft would specifically care quite deeply about this issue. Okay. That is all of that covered. Next, let's talk about the judge. We have officially had the first major court opinion in the legal battle between Epic and Apple, and it's a mixed one for Epic that does have a pretty major win, well, for Epic, and especially for just about all of their partners. So a federal judge has ruled that Apple cannot terminate access to Unreal Engine development tools on iOS and, uh, and Mac OS, uh, though Apple are not required to immediately reinstate Fortnite. So I think there you can see that you'll, you'll have a lot of happy people in the gaming industry. I think one of them is going to be Microsoft, based off the first story that we covered in today's video. This is Microsoft literally getting what they would have wanted there. Now, this does deal with Epic's, I think, most pressing concern, that Apple would remove access to the Unreal Engine tools on the 28th of August. That, of course, would be bad for a lot of game creators. It would also be bad for uh, Epic, because you've got to remember, for all the games that go on, on on iOS that use Unreal, Epic does make the Unreal Engine licensing fee from that, so it would hurt their business as well. Now, the judge's logic here is that Epic Games International, which owns Unreal Engine and operates a separate contract with Apple, is legal legally separate from the Epic that makes Fortnite, and uh, that Epic Games International have not violated any licensing agreements with Apple. So that's kind of funny. I guess that's corporate structure coming in to save the day, which is a bit odd, but uh, I think you kind of get the point here. So the judge ended up saying that blocking the Unreal Engine could indeed pose, quote, potential significant damage to the games industry. I mean, just to the games industry in general, pretty broad terms, but also pretty damn true. And this would be, of course, across third-party devs and also players, and that basically, while Epic and uh, Apple are free to argue with each other, the judge emphasized that their dispute should not create havoc to bystanders. So overall, I think an, an interesting move there. It's the sort of thing where I have to wonder if, uh, you know, that stuff with the corporate structure is just trying to legally weasel out of something to get the greater good and kind of like the spirit of the law. Uh, but then maybe in absolute terms, Epic kind of should have their stuff violated because they kind of did violate their, or, you know, removed because they did violate the rules. A bit interesting, but it does seem like pragmatically, this is probably, a, like, the best outcome for, uh, for the games industry in general. So I would say that, it, you know, provisionally, I am for it. Now, additionally, the judge was also, uh, well, also said they were unconvinced by Epic's claims of suffering, quote, irreparable harm if Fortnite is not allowed back into the App Store. And then basically, Epic got themselves into this mess by breaking Apple's rules with the direct payment option, but uh, they could also fix things by just going back to following the rules. And I think that's interesting. Is this the judge saying, look, 
you, you know, you goaded yourself into being slapped. Why are you now crying to me that you got slapped? I have to wonder if that's a little bit what the judge is kind of thinking there, because uh, I, not that that is, like, not that that's something that's enshrined in the law or anything, but you get my point, right? Epic baited Apple into removing them so that they could just unleash all hell upon Apple. And uh, this does seem to be the judge at least not really super, uh, you know, super sort of agreeing with that. Maybe that's the wrong thing to say. I would say doing it in a way that uh, is not immediately forcing Apple to reinstate um, Fortnite onto the App Store. Because yes, the option does exist for Epic that they could just remove direct payments from iOS and continue on as per normal. So I suppose then from a competitiveness situation, is it okay that yeah, Apple's rules just are that and it kind of sucks. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you're a Fortnite player and you care about getting a decent price on V-Bucks, that what? Instead, you can, uh, instead of using iOS or the Google Play Store, you can just install the APK directly in your phone and then use direct payments there. Or perhaps use, I believe it's the Samsung store that does support direct payments and then maybe that is still like an axis of competition which I guess then would sort of undercut maybe part of the sort of anti-competitiveness, anti-trust uh, point that Epic are trying to make with this case. So overall, look, this is a mixed result for Epic, but it's not over yet. While the judge stated that Epic hadn't shown, uh, hadn't yet shown, that they were likely to succeed in their uh, antitrust suit, he did say this, quote, serious questions do exist about Apple's store policies. And certainly if you, uh, um, you know, ask companies like Otto automatic what's going on with the Apple Store policies and a lot of Apple developers, you will find that a lot of Apple developers are pretty pissed for numerous reasons about how Apple runs that store. And that is something that came up in the recent hearings with the American government. So you could see more movement there, even if it's not specifically what Epic would want. Overall, though, this is a significant case which has garnered a lot of industry attention, a lot of mainstream attention as well. I mean, yeah, like with companies like Microsoft declaring support for Epic around the Unreal Engine point and just advocating for their overall health of the industry, it's big stuff. And I'm pretty damn excited to see where it goes next because trust me, this one will matter. Halo Infinite time. So fresh off the back of last week's expose from Therot into Halo's TV show messing with the game dev timeline, we've got a batch of new rumors and also a bit of a debunking. Uh, so it's a bit weird, right? So it seems like these rumors could be nonsense. They've been debunked by a number of different sources, but they really do show the extent to which, uh, you know, leaks and news will uh, will go when it's something like Halo. Now, theories have been going wild ever since the delay was announced, and uh, the newest theory is that the devs, 343 Industries, are set to drop the Xbox One version of uh, Halo Infinite entirely. So that's a rumor. I don't really think it's true, though. Now, the logic given is that developing for a seven-year-old console is proving difficult, for them with the Xbox One demo seriously struggling to load in assets and things. Apparently, um, you know, it's even worse than the infamous PC demo that we all saw. 343 will either have to modify the engine to run better in Xbox One or just axe it entirely. But at any rate, a further delay to 2022 isn't likely. Now, the internet is uh, unconvinced by this, unsurprisingly, uh, even, you know, even by the usual pinch of uh, salt sort of standards for leaks, it seems a bit wild. But it is weird because with the ROT's recent investment investigation into Halo Infinite's turbulent uh, development journey, getting harsh debunks and criticism online. And like, it's weird. We did cover that because it's the rot. It's Brad Sam's like that stuff is usually pretty damn rock solid. So, I mean, it's interesting that it that it just it's going like that. I think it just does show that there's a lot of mess here. I think that no matter what the specifics of rumors are, I think we can read into things not being ideal. And I think that's obvious. You know, ray tracing was going to be a patch. The game then didn't really look that good. And then a like first party console system seller game was being delayed until the next year, probably well after the console comes out. I don't think you need specific leaks or rumors to tell you that there are obviously significant issues going on there. Overall, though, I suppose there's always going to be leaks and speculation. It's probably something where we should just calm things down a little bit. I mean, there is also like a little bit of a theory that there is an inner cabal of disaffected 343 staff who are just leaking info online. That would make a lot of sense to me if, say, those engineering versus marketing things proved to be true. But honestly, it's anyone's guess at this stage. I would say, though, uh, like my, my personal opinion and the thing that I will stick by is that clearly things are not going well 
at that studio right now and that the game is clearly not on track, which, as somebody who has loved Halo for an extremely long time, is obviously very, very sad indeed. Next up, we've got sad news from Zero Lab. They're the developers of Skullgirls, which, uh, if anything, I'd say Skullgirls is exquisitely animated. It's actually what our lead animator um, taught herself uh, animation from. Uh, yeah, it was like a bunch of things from one of the lead, uh, lead animators there. So, great game, but uh, big issue because this week we've seen a wave of resignations from the studio and it's over the continued misconduct of the 100% owner, Mike Z. So, back in June, a number of people shared their experiences of working with him, and it basically just all spoke to highly inappropriate and uncomfortable things going on, but what ended up happening is that Zero Lab Games failed to address the allegations, and that prompted employees to try to deal with the matter themselves. So, Lab Zero's board apparently partnered with the aggrieved employees in an attempt to persuade Mike Z to step away from his leadership position as the sole owner of the studio, and uh, this would have transformed Zero Lab into some sort of worker-owned company with equity. Now, uh, Mike did enter those negotiations, but after having, quote, unrealistically high and potentially illegal demands, he uh, rejected to, uh, he basically just rejected what, uh, what the board wanted. Now, this has quite obviously been uh, the final straw for many people. We've seen loads of developers exit the studio and uh, actually share their dealings, their stories with Mike Z, um, the Skullgirls mobile devs, a hidden variable, and Autumn Games, who are the official IP holders of Skullgirls, also released a statement in support of the staff departures, with a hidden variable also stepping away from the relationship. It's quite wild. So the, the statement reads that Skullgirls is bigger than any individual, and uh, with that, I think Mike Z is very much on his own now. I imagine Skullgirls will continue, but... Uh, in some sort of new way. And when you really look into the allegations, it basically is just a litany of, like, just that's not how you talk to people. What's going on? I mean, I don't know what's going on with, uh, yeah, with, with some of these people. It's just weird. Like, in what universe do you feel like it's okay for that to be the regular way that you talk to your employees? I don't know. Seems a bit insane, but that's basically it for that story. And then finally, for today's news, a new Nintendo Switch model is apparently being planned for early next year, according to some reports. Now, this was first reported by the Taipei-based Economic Daily News, and then later corroborated by Bloomberg. And yeah, apparently, new machine, early 2021. And this is uh, kind of exciting. The rumors are pointing to a basically a pro model that could support 4K graphics that uh, might release alongside a number of unannounced first-party games, which, uh, I mean, certainly would explain the relatively empty slate of releases this year. Now, Switch Pro rumors have been around for a long time. I think really supported by people like me wanting them because the, you know, the biggest problem with the Switch is the Switch. It's a great format, but man, those Joy-Cons have got the worst analog sticks I've used in a long time. Playing games feels terrible on them. Uh, the Pro Controller is pretty sweet though, but like, man, the performance is so bad. I would love to play games like Breath of the Wild in, uh, well, you know, on hardware that I think those games actually deserve. And yes, many of the first parties, like the Mario games, run exquisitely and all of that stuff, but holy crap, trying to play the, the Spyro stuff, even like docked, is... It's just not a good time. But if there was a Switch Pro, then you really could have that situation where you could get nice 60 FPS graphics, you know, good resolution, things like that. Uh, and that would be a great thing. So hopefully that actually does happen. Anyway, that is it for today's game industry news. Of course, do you want some sweet loot? Do you play, I don't know, a Monk and Diablo or whatever games you play maybe when you're playing D&D or whatever? If you like that idea and you want the class pin, it's on our Patreon as well as a bunch of other art and uh, they're pretty thirsty looking sticker. So yeah, that's what's up on Patreon. Uh, thanks for all your support. And with that said, I will see you next time.